pray. Lord, we love you today. <clears throat> God, we thank you, Lord, once again that we have come into your house. And God, we have lifted up your name and we have magnified you. And God, we have given glory and honor to your mighty name because you alone, God, deserve all of the praise. And you alone deserve all of the adoration. All thanksgiving is due unto the mighty name of Jesus. God, I pray right now that under the authority of that name, God, you'll reach to this family right now, God, integral parts of the forming of our church that we have here, and God, that you would touch the Sims family, God, those here who were connected with Brother Sims and his pastorate here, I pray, God, that you would touch them, God, in the loss, God, of this man that was in their lives, I pray, God, for the family right now, and all that they're having to face and go through and the travels and things of that nature that they are facing. I pray, God, for your strength. God, I pray, Lord, for your peace. God, when we often don't understand why things happen the way that they do, God, we know that you are the comfort. God, you are the peace speaker. And God, I pray, Lord, that you will touch this morning. God, I pray that you'll touch us here in this service for the next few minutes. God, we have lifted you up and magnified you. God, we've invited your presence God, into this house, and we feel you here today. And I pray, Lord, that you will touch in the next few minutes. God, anoint my mind, God, to speak. God, anoint my lips, God, to deliver your anointed word. And God, we're going to give you all of the praise and all of the glory, all of the adoration that is due unto the mighty name of Jesus, because you alone are worthy in Jesus' precious name. Everyone said in Jesus' name. If you'll get your Bibles. And uh, open them up this morning. Let me just read one verse of Scripture. Actually, two uh, different verses of Scripture, uh, basically repeating the same thing. Uh, but I want to read these to you this morning. Matthew chapter 16 and verse uh, number 26. Matthew 16 and verse number 26 says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then it follows that statement up with another statement and says, and this, of course, is Jesus speaking. And he says, what shall a man give in exchange? Everybody say exchange. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, that was recorded by Matthew. But when we flip over to the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 36 and 37, the same thing is recorded here by Mark as well. And he said, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? What have you gained if you gain everything in this world but you lose your soul at the same time? And again, he repeats the statement of Jesus when he says, Or what shall a man give? It's almost as if the first statement he said was, you know, if you're going to gain all of this stuff and lose your soul, I mean, what profit did you really make when you look at the weights and balances of all of it and you gained everything in the world, amassed everything in the world, but you lost your soul? He said, there's no, there's no profit in that. He said, there's nothing there that you would profit from. But then he, he kind of gets even deeper when he simply says, I, I just really want to know what is there even possible to exchange? What shall a man give in exchange what can somebody bring you what can someone give you in exchange for your soul so i want you to look at somebody next to you as you're seated here this morning and just simply tell them say no exchanges no exchanges and you can be seated this morning last week i spoke to you about heaven and how we want to go there. How many of you want to go to heaven? I want to go to heaven, and we talked about that last week. But uh, this week I felt strongly not to preach on hell, but maybe to speak on the idea of not getting to heaven. There's a big difference. I, I think we can get caught up in living for God for the wrong reason. And let, let me explain just a little bit. I, I don't want to live for God and to follow his commands and follow all of the things that he asks us to do because I don't want to go to hell. I think we could get living for God for the wrong reason. I'm just doing everything you've asked me to do and I'm just doing the things that are written in your book and I'm just doing the commands that you have given simply because I don't want to go to hell. The change of that or the, the flip of that, I guess you would say, is I want to live for him and I want to follow his plans because I don't want to miss heaven. Not because I don't want to go to hell, but because I don't want to miss 
heaven. I, I don't want to live for him. I want to follow his plans. I want to do what God has called me to do. Because here's the reality. If we only live for God to keep from going to hell, you'll always be looking for the minimum you have to do to get by. What, what is the minimum I have to do just not to go to hell? And boy, we could go down a laundry list of things and start saying, well, if I do this, am I going to hell? If I do this, am I going to hell? And you're living for God for the wrong reason. You're just trying to keep from going to hell. I don't want to live for God that way. If you live this life with a passion of not missing heaven, listen to the flip of this. If you live life with a passion of not missing heaven, you will do whatever it takes to get there. You're not going to be looking for the minimum because you wouldn't want to come that close and just miss it. And so if you're living with a passion that says, I don't want to miss heaven, there's going to be a different mentality about that. If you're living the life of, of, of God and you're, you're walking with God in this relationship with God, and the only way you're looking at that relationship is I just don't want to go to hell. It's like a marriage relationship. Isn't it funny how God puts all of that in there together? If the only reason that you're married and taking care of your wife is because you don't want her to be mad at you. Some of you just went, just, well, you just stepped where I live right now. You're only doing the things for her and you're only taking her because you don't want her to be mad at you. Or better yet, let me get where the men really live. Women, cover your ears for just a second. Let me just tell you what the men really think. I'm only doing it because I don't want to hear her harp on me. Okay, women, now you can open your ears back up because I wouldn't want you to think that's really how men think sometimes. I just don't want to hear it, so I'm going to do everything I can. That, what you're doing is looking for the minimum I have to do to get by. Here's what I can explain to you. If you'll love that woman and take care of that woman like she's the best prize you've ever gotten, you won't ever have to worry about whether she harps on you or she does this or she does that because she's going to return it back to you the same way. It's the relationship with God. I'm not living just to get by, just the minute. What do I have to do to keep from going to hell? If you come in and ask that question, you're living for God for the wrong reason. Better yet, let something drive you and push you that says, I need to do whatever it takes so that I don't miss heaven. I don't want to just uh, go into hell, cause me to try to negotiate. Do I, do I really have to do that? If I'm, if I'm living just so I don't have to go to hell, I promise you, you get into negotiation mode. You ready? I said I wasn't going to do it, but I guess I'm going to. Was, we were watching Brother Mark Morgan last night, or last Sunday night, those of you that were here, and he said, okay, well, I guess I will. Here's the thing. Am I going to go to hell over drinking one beer? If you're asking that question, you're living for God for the wrong reason. I don't know the answer to that question. You can pull out the scripture and say, well, it says not to be drunk. Okay. But where does that line cross? So if I'm just living for God so that I don't go to hell, then I'm going to look for excuses and reasons why I can do things I want to do. That's living in my flesh. But if I'm going, you know what? I don't even want to get near it because I don't want to miss out. I don't want there to be an opportunity that I might not make heaven because it's not worth it to me. There is nothing the world has to offer. He said, what can a man give you in exchange? It's just not worth it to me. And so I can try to justify and I can try to look for reasons and I can try to negotiate the best I can. But uh, th this concept was so important to Jesus that when he questions the, his disciples and, and in the scripture that we read, he's questioning them right after the revelation of who he is. Peter receives this revelation. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He gets this revelation and then immediately he follows into this process of somebody giving up on this. We talked about heaven last week and why in the world would you ever want to exchange heaven for anything this world has to offer why i know a man I, I don't i don't see him here this morning i was looking for him this morning but uh, i know a man some of you uh, may know him he's he's a good trader he's a good negotiator he's a good deal maker whatever you want to call it he he was so good that i never could figure out what vehicle he was driving because he'd pull up in something different all the time because he just traded it he wouldn't even get the tag back before he'd have it traded and need to send it off for another one. Some of you know who I'm talking about. His name is Shane Walker. 
He's one of the best at trading or exchanging of anybody I know. And we were talking just Saturday, and he said something about else he was trading or something he was doing. I said, man, you are a perfect example for my message on Sunday. He said, I'm glad I can give you material. I said, brother, if you only knew the people that give me material. <laughs> He's good at it. But you know what? He hit a rock the other day that he couldn't get beyond. Because he got rid of that big fancy diesel truck that he had. You know, he sold that. And the first thing he did, as soon as he knew it was sold, Sister Michelle will back this up for me. He called me up. He said, Pastor, you want to sell your truck? I said, who's buying? He said, me. He said, I'm looking for a good used truck that's been taken well care of. I said, so am I. And I said, and that's why I'm keeping my truck. And he tried again another time, and I said, ain't going to work, St. Walker. I am not letting my truck go. And I said, here's why. You ready? I can't replace what I have with what you're going to give me for my truck. Mm. When the adversary comes to you and says, I want to just exchange something with you. I want to give you something that the world has to offer in exchange. For, I won't know why you don't understand or why you don't see that there is nothing you have to offer that I could ever, ever replace what God has given me. It can't happen. I don't, I don't care how good of a negotiator you are. I, I don't care how good of a trader you are. You, there's just sometimes you're going to run into it, and he found out there are no exchanges here. Not happening. One of the worst exchanges that took place in all of history. If you ever thought you had a bad deal, think again. Because on April the 12th, 1976, Ronald Wayne. Does anybody even know who Ronald Wayne is? Mm. <laughs> there's the first problem. Who said I do? Of course. <laughs> Ronald Wayne was one of the three initial creators, co-founders of Apple computers. He sold his 10% share of the company for $800. <laughs> he even got an additional $1,500 because he was willing to give up all future rights to Apple. Today, Apple Computer is one of the most valuable companies in the world worth about $600 billion. His 10%, just in case you're doing some math, would have been $60 billion. Just since 1976. I don't know about you, but that hurts. That's a bad, bad exchange rate right there. So for 2300 bucks, you gave up $60 billion. It's a real harsh reality that Ron Wayne has to wake up to and face every morning. He wakes up to this, this realization of being one of the original founders of the consumer uh, electronics giant. Ron, here's the deal. He dumped his shares when he became convinced that Steve Jobs' reckless spending was going to drive that startup company into the ground and wanted to protect his assets from any kind of future bankruptcy. <laughs> Today, Steve Jobs' widow owns 0.5% of ownership in Apple, which is worth $4 billion. Here's the thing, Ron designed the company, he designed their original logo, he wrote the manual for the first Apple I computer. Jobs even tried to, on several occasions, get Wayne to return to Apple, but it was to no avail, he wouldn't do it. And so, Wayne worked for Atari. Some of you have never even heard of Atari. <laughs> he developed Pong. <laughs> it takes about an 80s child to really understand that concept and so he, he worked with Atari until 78 and then later he moved into some uh, labs work that he was doing but today uh, when this was reported anyway he was living off of a meager monthly social security check in a mobile home park in a very remote area of Nevada about as far out in the middle of nowhere as you can possibly get he's occasionally seen playing the penny slots he spends time collecting rare coins and stamps. 
Here's a kicker to the whole thing. Ron has never purchased an Apple product. (laughs) One of the worst exchanges in history. But see, here's the thing. The greatest example of refusing to exchange is found in the temptation of Jesus. We have to come to the realization in this room this morning that the devil wants to exchange what you have, not because he wants it, but because he doesn't want you to have it. Have you ever found that little child on the playground? They didn't really want the toy. They just didn't want you to have the toy. They got 12 toys in their hands. But you picked up one, they want that one too. They don't want it, they just don't want you to have it. That's the way the devil plays. It's not that he wants what you have because he can't use what you have because God's already taken care of that. He just don't want you to have it. And so everything that comes into your head sometimes is not of God. You need to understand, the devil's job is to derail you into believing a lie. And Jesus was tempted, yet he didn't exchange. Nor did he sin. And it's found in Matthew 4 and verse 11. Let me just kind of read through this quickly. It said, Jesus was led into the spirit of the wilderness uh, to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. (laughs) Go figure. When the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. He tried to change his fleshly hunger and be his provider. He wanted to take it and and show him that he was going to be his provider. But he answered and said, it is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so that wasn't good enough. So the devil takes him up into a holy city and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands thou shalt bear thee up, lest thou shalt dash thy foot at any time against the stone. Notice he's trying to use the word. The devil will try to use the word with you. That's why you got to make sure you know the word. He tried to get him to look to the devil for protection. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again, the devil take him to an exceeding high mountain. Show them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto them, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. We just heard this last Sunday night. He he tried to become his authority, tried to trade your glory for my glory. Satan doesn't have any glory. And then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for again, what did he say? It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Now, this is something that's on a complete different side note. I'm just going to throw this in just because we kind of covered a little bit last week. But on a complete side note, if Jesus was an eternal son, as the Trinity doctrine would like to teach it, then wouldn't Satan have known who he was tempting? You sent that by too fast, Pastor. You need to slow that down again. Okay. Wasn't Satan and, and a third of the angels, weren't they kicked out of heaven? First of all, kicked out of heaven for trying to take authority that didn't belong to them. And so they were kicked out of heaven. So that means they were present in heaven. So that means if Jesus was always in heaven, an eternal son, then Satan would have known him and wouldn't, have, wouldn't even have tried to tempt him because he would have already known who he was. There's more scripture to back that up, but just, just a little added note. Just, just so you understand and confirm that Jesus, the flesh, was not eternal, but he was the only begotten son of God. You've got to be begotten. You've got to have a beginning. He wasn't eternal. And Satan would have known that when he came to tempt him. And so he would have recognized him. But the temptation of Jesus, what you have to understand is that he came to him when he was weak and tried to get him to exchange some things. He, he offered him things to see if he was really the son of God. I, I want to offer you some things and see what you'll do with it. Remember, What you have to remember is that he will wait until you are at a weak moment. Satan is not coming to you after a fiery church service when your faith is absolutely through the roof. He is patiently going to wait until you're weak. He's not hitting you after you're dancing out of here on a Sunday night or shouting out of here on a Sunday morning. He's not going to hit you then. He's going to wait for a moment when you are absolutely weak. He will patiently wait. He's a bully. That's why we said last week that faithfulness to church is so important. 
I wasn't just trying to throw that in to get you to come to church. I was telling you faithfulness to church is important. The reason it's important is you get strength through the word of God. You get strength by the brothers and sisters that are around you. You get strength and power in the middle of a worship service when we begin to start shouting things like no name like the name Jesus and nobody's got power like Jesus and we start being to go through those things and start saying those things. We get our strength. That's why it's important that I show up to church. Not just so I don't get a phone call from somebody saying, where were you? We missed you. But so that I will come. Again, I don't want to miss heaven. And so he tried to exchange. He tried to exchange with Jesus, but he said, not today. It is written. It is written. The most powerful weapon you have to negotiate through any kind of an exchange with the devil is absolutely the word of God. God will always back up his word. If the devil can get us to exchange our stance on some things, then he will feel like he's already won part of the battle. He just wants to get you to exchange some things. That that is his whole endeavor to get you out of your place in God so that you lose the authority you have over him. That's his whole purpose. If he can get you out of that relationship with God, get you away from that authority with God, the authority that you have over him, that's what he's looking for. Understand, and I've said this before, the devil has no power, no authority over us, only what we allow him to have through some sort of exchange. That's the only way he has any power over you, is that you have allowed it through some sort of exchange. Tried to exchange with Jesus, but Jesus just said, it is written, it is written, you can't You can't do it because it is written. And so we have the spirit of God. And the scripture simply says in Mark 16, verses 15 through 18, it said unto them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, watch, shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and and drink any deadly thing and it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That is being a true apostolic. That's what it means. That's being a true apostolic. Look what happened around here over the last several months. Look at the healings that have taken place. Look at how God has opened doors and and miracles and things that have taken place amongst the church over the last several months. That's not just because we had a guest a guest speaker or just because we had a good worship service on a Sunday night. That's not the only reason why that happened. It's because we recognize the power that is in us. We have to be apostolic, not just in appearance. But in action, it's more than just looking the look. We got to walk the walk. We got to have it in action. And, and we understand that it's, it's when a weak moment comes, it seems that all of hell is coming against me. And that's when he's going to offer you an exchange. But be encouraged this morning because the word says this in Isaiah 54 and 17, that no weapon, everybody say no weapon. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage, the servants of the Lord. The devil is going to custom tailor a weapon to attack you with. What, what may work against one may not work against somebody else. And so what you have to understand about the adversary is he's going to study you. He's going to study you and he's going to find that one thing that you might be willing to exchange for. But remember, the only thing he has to work with, I need you to hear this. The only thing he has to work with is your past. The only place he can form a weapon from is your past. That is why it is so important that you deal with your past and get it under the blood so he can't use it against you. I don't have time to go into that, but I'm just telling you, realize the only place he can form a weapon is from your past. And so you've got to deal with that past. You've got to get it under the blood. You've got to get forgiveness for it. You've got you to get with God and say, God, help me take care of it. Because if you don't, the devil's going to bring it back to use against you. It's the only place he has to go. And he'll get you as an individual to try to exchange. And he'll get us as a church to try to exchange some things as a church body. And I'm just here to proclaim to you this morning that if we as a church are even considering moving away from foundational truths that have separated us from the world, then I'll just turn in my resignation because I'm not going there. 
I'm not going to do it. If that's what we as a church want to do, I'm just not going to do it because I still believe that it requires repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost to make it to heaven. I still believe it. I also believe that it doesn't stop there. I believe that living a holy lifestyle is required. Jesus said, be ye holy, for I am holy. Well, what does that mean? I I don't know. It's pretty clear. Be holy, for I am holy. We covered some of that last week. You can go back and get the DVD and watch it from last week. But we have come way too far. I need somebody to hear me this morning. We have come way too far and returned to the return of God as being too close for me to make changes now. I'm not going to exchange anything. I have come way too far. It's gotten way too close for God's return for me to exchange anything now. Somebody shout no exchanges. Listen, there's people in the Bible who did exchanges. Matter of fact, Judas exchanged for 30 pieces of silver. There was once a rich man who was very near death and he was very grieved because he had worked so hard for his money and wanted to be able to take it to heaven with him. And so he began to pray. He began to pray and and ask and see if maybe it would be possible that he could take some of his wealth with him. And an angel hears his plea and appears to him. He says, sorry, but you can't can't take your wealth with you. You can't, can't take it with you. And the man implores the angel to speak to God on his behalf that maybe this one time he might just bend the rules a little bit for me just this one time if you could talk to him. And so the man continued to pray that his wealth could follow him to heaven. And and finally the angel reappears to him and he informs him that, that, that God has decided to allow you to take one suitcase with you. And overjoyed, the man gathers his largest suitcase, of course, and he fills it with pure gold bars. And he places it beside his bed. Soon after, it wasn't long that the man died and he shows up at the gates of heaven to greet St. Peter. And Peter, seeing the suitcase, says to him, he says, hold on, you can't can't bring that in here. And the man begins to explain to Peter that he's had permission and permission has been given to him uh, by the Lord. And so, uh, you know, just just ask. And so Peter goes and, and finds out and verifies the man's story. And sure enough, Peter comes back and he says, well... He says, you're right, you're allowed to bring one suitcase. He said, but I'm supposed to check it before you bring it in. I got to check the contents before letting you through. And so Peter opens up uh, the suitcase to inspect the the worldly items that the man found too precious to leave behind. And he explains, oh, you brought pavement. Thank you. (laughs) See, here's the reality. What we think is valuable isn't really that valuable. See, what you have to understand is the God you serve. See, see, Judas exchanged for 30 pieces of silver. What you have to understand is the things we think are valuable. I don't care how much gold you can amass. God just looks at it as pavement. He's just lying in the streets of heaven with it. It really doesn't mean that much when you get into God's kingdom and what God sees as worthy and what God thinks is worthy. And so no money is worth exchanging my soul over. Lot's wife exchanged for the love of the world. Satan, as I mentioned already, and a third of the angels exchanged for their perceived power. Watch this. Satan, or, or Satan, I'm sorry, Samson exchanged for a relationship. What are you willing to exchange? The rich young ruler exchanged for prestige. Sell all you have and follow me. I, I don't know if I can do that. The actor Jim Carrey made this statement. He said, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. So the rich young ruler exchanged for prestige. King Agrippa held on to position when he said to the apostle Paul, almost, almost, I mean the deal was there, almost thou persuadest me. Esau exchanged everything for a bowl of bean soup. What are you willing to exchange for? So the question I have for you this morning is, what will you exchange for? People in Scripture exchange for what we would think would be, you know, looking back now, we can look at somebody like Judas and go, how in the world would you ever 
exchange what you had with God for 30 pieces of silver. How in the world? But you know what? There's some of us that do that every day. So here's what I want to do. I want to try to help you understand this a little bit this morning. And so um, I don't have these in any particular order. Um, but I need, I need uh, a couple of adults here to help me. And I'm just going to. Uh, I'm just going to call on you, and I'm just not even going to, like, there's no real rhyme or reason, okay? So don't feel like he just picked me out, okay? So, uh, Brother Michael, why don't you come up here? Because um, they know if I'm going to pick on Mr. DeCab, then it, it just don't matter, so. Uh, Brother Tim, why don't you come up here? Um, let, me, let me get uh, uh, a lady to, to come up here. Sister Jenny, can you come up here and help me? I know you don't like that, but I think this will be good. She don't like me to bring her up and do that kind of stuff, but it'll be okay. Sister Krista, will you come help me? And then I need, I need just, uh, just two more. You can just stand right here. Uh, Brother Joe, why don't you come? And um, Brother Butch, why don't you come? Now, I'm going to give these to you, and I want you just to keep them, <clears throat> keep them folded, okay, and, and until I get to you. But I, I'm just curious of what we would exchange, okay? And so... Um, let me just, just kind of hold that and keep that there. And, um, you know, I'm just going to try to, I, I'm, I know what they say, but I'm trying to, you know, avoid placing anything because I don't want anybody to think I'm doing it on purpose. So, <clears throat> okay. So my question here this morning, I mentioned several in scripture that exchanged some things. And so I really kind of just want this to hit home and this is it. I'm, I'm getting close. I'm winding down. But I want to ask some people this morning, I'm going to use them as examples, but this is really for everybody in the room. So I want to ask you, what are you willing to exchange? Let me just slow down for just a minute and try to get real where we live for just a moment. So what is it that you're willing to exchange? Again, we can look at somebody like Judas. We can look at somebody like Samson. We can look at these people and go, how in the world would you ever do that? Why would you ever do something like that? And yet we do this all the time. And so if Jesus was to come back today... Is there something that we're hanging on to that would cause us? Again, what do I have to do to not go to hell? Or what do I have to do to keep from missing heaven? Two different ways to look at it. So, uh, Brother Butch, what are you willing to exchange your soul for? Nicotine, drugs, alcohol, addiction. Just turn that around there. So, I see this happen every day. Get people who are willing to let an addiction... Whether, whatever it may be, whether it's nicotine or drugs or alcohol, pornography, immorality, whatever it is, you can make the laundry list, whatever the addiction may be, that they're willing to walk away from the kingdom of God or walk away from the blessings of God, again, because of some addiction. And again, where did this come from? It's in my past. And so the reason it shows back up again is because it may be something in my past. There's plenty of us in this room right now that if I were to ask you to all stand up and, and give a testimony, there'd be some of you in this room right now, many of us, that had some sort of an addiction before we came to God. So if the adversary is going to come after you, he's going to maybe use that weapon of addiction to try to pull back because he doesn't see what's coming. He only sees where you've been. And he said if they fell for it before, they might fall for it again. So what are you willing to exchange? Is any of it worth it? Brother Butch, is any of that worth losing heaven over? Is anything on there worth losing heaven? Well, it's easy to say when we're standing up here in front of everybody, but what are we doing when nobody's looking? Is any of it worth it? How about Brother Joe? Let's see. What are you willing to exchange for? Mm. Boy, there's some relationships that have caused some people to walk away from God because that relationship seemed more valuable than what God had to offer. I'm telling you, let me speak to our young people, college career age. Let me speak to y'all for just a minute, our singles. Let me just tell you something. He ain't good looking enough and she ain't pretty enough. Hear me. To give up on what God has in store for your life. Listen, let me take it a little bit further. There's some relationships on your job. There's some relationships maybe in the places that you go that you probably need to avoid because it's going to be something that pulls down on you rather than help encourage you and lift you up. Relationships can cause you to miss heaven. 
But what relationships can I have and just not go to hell? The question ought to be what relationships can I have to make sure that I make it to heaven? I'm telling you, there's not a man, there's not a woman, there's not a boy, a girl that is worth losing heaven. You better set the bar and set the bar high. I need somebody who loves God. I need somebody who supports the kingdom of God. I need somebody who's walking with God. Don't settle for anything less. It's not worth the exchange. I'm telling you, they don't get good enough. They don't get, and listen, let me just, let me just solve this issue for you right off the bat. You're not going to change them. Don't take that chance because that is a lie of the adversary. Now, I know there's been some situations where it's happened, but listen to me. It is a lie of the adversary that if you'll just go and do what they're doing, you can get them to come and do what you're doing. Watch where you're fishing and watch what bait you're using because you're only going to catch what bait you're sending out. Oh. Boy, I could bring Brother Jeff up here and help me with this for just a minute. But I'm not going to catch some things if I put out the wrong kind of bait. You want a bottom feeder? Then put the junk out there that bottom feeders like to have. But if you want something pristine, you want something that God has got for you in store, then make sure you're putting out what you want to receive. Don't exchange it. It's not worth it. Listen to me, girls. Listen to me, boys. It's not worth losing heaven over. It is not worth it. There's not a relationship that's worth the exchange. Don't fall for that trap. Don't fall for that. Sister Crystal, what about you? What are you willing to exchange? Oh. The devil tried that with Jesus. I mean, I can give you all of this. You can become popular. People will know who you are. Listen, here's what I need you to understand. I don't care if anybody knows who I am. As long as Jesus knows who I am, it really doesn't matter to me. I can go back to the statement that Jim Carrey made and said, I wish everybody would become as popular as they can, make as much money they can, be as famous as they can. I wish they could all get it so they'd realize it's not worth it. It's really not worth it. And so what are you willing to exchange just so some people will know who you are? What are you willing to exchange? Young people, what are you willing to exchange in your school? What are you willing to exchange when you look at others and go, well, if I'll do this, then I'll be popular. Oh, you're just an outcast. You're just a nobody. If you'll do this, you're going to be popular. It's an exchange. And so what are you willing to exchange? What will a man exchange? What will a woman exchange? What will a young person exchange? Here's the problem, and I'm just going to touch this and move on, but here's part of the problem with some of these that are already showing. I've got adults that are teaching our kids this is what we do. Oh, I would never tell my child, you don't have to. You show them all the time the exchange that you're making, what's more valuable, what's more important. Listen, there is nothing, there is no popularity, I don't care. That's worth it. There's no relationship that's worth it. There's no addiction that's worth it. Brother Tim, how about you? Oh, money. Yeah. That's a good one. Here, you ready? Here comes the exchange. Here comes the lie. If I could just make more money, I could help the kingdom more. Wow, that got quiet, didn't it? Because that's an exchange. Because in order for me to make... Now, listen. There is nothing against making money. Okay? The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. Don't get that misconception. It says the love of it. If you love that money more than you love the kingdom of God, you're making an exchange. Hello? If there's anything that you love more, that job that you have, if you love that more than you love the kingdom of God because of what it's bringing in, listen, I've told you this over and over. If you missed the, the Blessed Life series in the beginning of the year, you need to go back and get it. You need to understand that job is not your supplier. God is. That job doesn't supply your needs. God supplies them. God supplies those needs. And so don't get caught up in the fact that I need more money. And definitely don't listen to the lie of the adversary that says if you have more money, you'd be more valuable to the kingdom of God. 
Here's what you need to realize. God don't need your money. I told you that last week. Now, yes, I want you paying your tithe and giving your offering, but not because God needs it, because you don't want to be cursed. You want to be blessed. That's why you do it. There's no amount of money. 30 pieces of silver. It's worth it. How much? How much? Somebody wrote you a check, Brother Ron, for about, I don't know, $2 billion. Is that worth it? Hang on, stop. Think of all the things you could do for the kingdom of God. But in order to do that, I want you to sacrifice this. Well, I'm just going to be the hero. I'll be the one guy that takes it for the team, and then I'll be able to help everybody else. Sounds reasonable, right? It's called an exchange. Okay, Sister Jenny, what you got? Worldly fashion. Well, why'd you end up with that one? Are you willing to exchange it for worldly fashion? Hmm. I don't have to worry about that, right? We're not worried about worldly fat. I don't have to. Okay, good. Here's the thing. Sister Jenny, you'll attest to this for me. How many will, will exchange their walk with God over a little outfit? Did I just get as basic as I could? How many of us are willing to exchange just to have that? Remember, Lot's wife wanted what Sodom had. Even after been given the warning, even after angels coming and pushing them out of Sodom, she couldn't help it. She had to look back. The fashions of the world, the things of the world. We, we, you know, we have a holiness standard. We have a holiness separation. Not because it's a rule of the church. It's because what God asked for. Be ye holy because I'm holy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But my question is, what are you willing to exchange? Well, you know, it'll be okay. It, it'll be all right. I, I, surely I won't go to hell over this. <laughs> Is that the exchange you want to play with? What I don't want to miss hell over? Or what I don't want to have to go to hell over? It needs to be more, what do I not want to miss heaven over? I, I, I don't want to miss heaven. And that's just not worth it to me at all. And I've told the story of a young man one time in and in a, a situation that was going on and he asked me about wearing something and doing this and I, i'm not gonna get all the details but he asked me about it and i said you know what it's probably not wrong i said but what if you got to god and god said that was the one thing that kept you from going would it be important then he said yeah i said so then why chance it why chance it it's not worth it worldly fashion last one brother michael what do you have there what's willing to exchange oh Wow, I have heard that. I can't tell you how many times since I've been in DeKalb County. You know, if my family wasn't going here, this is where I'd want to come. I've had people literally tell me, I don't get fed where I'm at. But because my family's there, I, I can't leave. Traditions that take place, things that happen, friends that I have. It's, it's all a matter of exchanging. And so what are you willing to exchange this morning? Y'all can just lay those on the altar. Thank you. What, what are you willing to exchange this morning? And I could come up with more categories. I could do more things. I, I, could, I could come up with more stuff. I, I just tried to pull you the ones that were in Scripture of what the other people exchanged. What, what's willing to exchange for? If music will come. I want you to understand something this morning. The greatest exchange in history, in the history of creation that ever took place in your favor, happened at Calvary. The Almighty God robed himself in flesh and became a sacrifice for you and me. Here was the exchange He exchanged His blood for our salvation. That was the greatest exchange that's ever taken place in your favor. See, Satan does not see into your future. The only thing he sees is your past. So please hear me when I tell you this this morning. He can't steal the promises that God has given you, but he can try to get you off track to lose your identity so that you never receive those promises. <clears throat> he says, if you will just... 
exchange with me. You ready? I'm fixing to take you down a path that many of us have had been down. If you will just exchange with me, then I'll leave you alone. I'll get off your children. I'll get off your family. I'll get off your finances. I'll get off with the struggles that you have and stop tempting you. I'll, I'll, if you'll just exchange that authority you have, I'll leave you alone. Listen, I, I know that you get tired of fighting. I know. I know you get tired of taking the blows from the enemy. Let me just tell you, so do I. But he continues until he can get us to a point of weakness when we finally say, okay, 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 I'll exchange. Just leave me alone. So I go back to ask you, why, why would we exchange all that heaven has to offer for an eternity to gain, if you will, what the world has to offer temporarily? What does it profit? Where's the balance? I wish I could get you to understand this morning that if the devil was not afraid of you, he would not be trying to make a deal with you. Stand with me. I don't know what it takes to get you to realize that if the devil was not afraid of you, he would not be trying to make an exchange with you. Because here's what he tells his imps that are working with him. If those apostolics, if those children of God ever wake up and see who they really are, I'm telling you we're in trouble. So this morning you and I have a decision to make. We have a choice to make. We have to decide, are there exchanges? Or is there a no exchange policy? My faith, my family, my salvation, my holiness, my relationship with God. What are you willing to exchange? Would you just bow your heads this morning as we begin to pray here this morning? And I, I just want to ask you, what, what is it that, that you have in your life right now that you just can't see yourself letting go of. Because the sad reality is, can I just get plain where we live? You're one car accident away from having it all gone. Can I just get where we really live this morning and tell you that you're just one disease away from it all being gone? Can I be real with you this morning and let you know that nothing, nothing you have, you can take with you. Nothing possession-wise you have.